Hello and welcome to Mr. Linford's Math Course. In today's discussion, we're going to be talking about an application problem, in particular an application to our work with matrices, and that's working with balancing chemical equations. We're going to talk about what a chemical equation is, and then actually get into how we can use our knowledge of matrices to help us complete this task. Now let's first get into talking about what a chemical equation is and trying to get this understanding of what balance means within a chemical equation. Now we first define a chemical equation, and there's a lot of ways of defining this, a lot more complicated ways and a lot more technical ways, but for us we're going to say that a chemical equation is a symbolic representation of a reaction in which chemicals interact with each other to form different products. So let's see what that means, a symbolic representation. Well, symbolic representation in mathematics is an equation. It's where we use symbols, whether that's variables, numbers, etc., to define an equation. In our sense, when it comes to chemicals, we use chemical symbols to define the equation. So this right here is an example of a chemical reaction where we have sodium hydroxide combining with hydrochloric acid, okay? What we're doing here is we're taking chemicals that interact together and causing a reaction. So this plus sign here is saying that you are going to take these two chemicals, these two molecules, these two compounds, whatever it is, you're going to combine them together and you're going to get a reaction. This arrow right here represents the direction of the reaction, okay? You are taking sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. You're combining them together. That arrow means here is what you get after that reaction. After the reaction, you get sodium chloride and water. Now, I could just give you this word equation right here. Sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid react to give you sodium chloride and water. However... If I gave you the equation with the chemical representation, the actual names and chemical structures, that's going to be a lot more information for us. What I mean by that is, if you look at our equation right here, you'll see that I have used the periodic table of elements, the actual chemical abbreviations on the periodic table for the... Um, for the chemicals, for the compounds. So when it comes to sodium hydroxide, I'm telling you that it's, an, that it's Na, O, and H. I'm telling you that I have the structure of sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen. When it comes to hydrochloric acid, I'm telling you that I have the structure of hydrogen and that's chlorine, right? Yeah, I, oh gosh, I need to go back and take a look at my periodic table of elements. But the idea here is, in this symbolic equation, I'm showing you what atoms and what elements, I should say, make up these different compounds. And I'm telling you how much. Notice when you see this little 2 here for the H2O? That tells you how many atoms there are in this particular structure. H2O, this says, hey, you have two hydrogen atoms to make water. So if you remember back to high school chemistry, a water molecule, this would be an oxygen atom. This would be a hydrogen atom. And this would be a hydrogen atom. Oops. You get the idea. So this is the structure to water. It tells us, hey, not necessarily that you have one sodium, one oxygen, and one hydrogen, like in this case. In the water case, you have two hydrogens going on with one oxygen, 
okay? So the idea here, these subscripts, what they do is they tell you how many atoms you need in this particular molecule. If there are no subscripts, like in every other example in this case, that just means you have one of each of the elements. You have one atom of each of the elements. So clearly, this symbolic representation is telling us a lot of information. There's a couple vocab terms I want us to talk about really quick, and that is... Um, really how we also just further describe what's going on here. You'll oftentimes hear these chemicals, these compounds, these elements, uh, whatever you want to call them. These particular things that are reacting together are called the reactants. These are the reactants, the things that are reacting together. And after the reaction, maybe I'll label the arrow as the reaction, meaning something's happened, you get these, which are called the products, or the products of the reaction, okay? So this symbolic representation tells us, okay, Here's the chemicals that you combine together. Here are the compounds, the molecules, whatever. When these combine together, they're going to react and form these compounds, these chemicals, these products, okay? Hopefully this is starting to make some sense to you and you're remembering back to your science courses. But one other thing I want us to talk about that is oftentimes brought up in a high school science, but... They sometimes wait till the end to really dive into the importance of this. Is the law of the conservation of mass? This is a property, a law, a really defined idea within um, science, whether it's in physics, chemistry, etc., that the mass of a closed system cannot change. Now, there's a couple things I mean by that. First off, what the heck's a closed system? So, in our case, uh, a rather simple way of thinking about it is, imagine this reaction, okay, this sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid reaction. This is going to be a closed system in that no amount of matter is escaping, okay? When I combine sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, I'm going to get sodium chloride and water. There's no escaping of matter, no escaping of energy. Like, I'm not creating any energy or heat that gets lost within this. I, I'm not having any matter escape. What I mean by closed is, here are the reactants, they come together, and here is the result of that. Here are the products, okay? So I guess really what we mean by this idea, the conservation of mass, is the common phrase that, Mass is neither created or destroyed. Let me write that a little nicer. Mass is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. Okay? What we're saying here is that what you start with is what you end with. Remember, mass is really, well, it's not weight. Weight is a, um, it's a force that's related to gravity and mass. But really, mass is, think of it as a measure of how much matter is contained um, in a, a physical structure, okay? So how much matter is contained in a physical structure. And the more matter you have, the more weight there will be, okay? Now, um, mass is saying here that, by saying it's neither created nor destroyed, however much mass you started with is how much you're going to, re you're going to end up with, uh, during the chemical reaction. And nothing is going to be lost or created in this case. How can we see that in this symbolic representation of a chemical interaction? Well, it's actually pretty simple. First off, take a look at the left-hand side here. Notice that we have one 
sodium element, okay? There was one sodium atom in this interaction. We also have one oxygen atom that's on this side. We also have one chlorine atom on this side, and we have two hydrogen atoms. This makes up the actual mass of the reactants. The now uh, keep in mind that elements or, or uh, yeah elements actually do have masses to them. Okay, it's on the periodic table. You can read more into that. But basically, we have a certain mass on the left hand side. The reactants. It's the mass of the sodium atom, the oxygen atom, the chlorine atom, and the two hydrogen atoms. What we want to see in the product side, on the right-hand side, we want to see the same amount of each type of atom, okay? We're not destroying atoms in this chemical reaction. We're not creating new atoms. I want to see if the right-hand, I'm sorry, if the left-hand side has a sodium atom to it, I want to see that on the right-hand side. And if there is an oxygen atom on the left-hand side, I want to see that on the right-hand side as well. And if there's one chlorine atom on the left-hand side, it better be um, on the right-hand side as well. And since there were two hydrogen atoms on the left-hand side, notice that there are two hydrogen atoms on the right-hand side as well. We have the same amount of the same type of atoms on each side. Let me rephrase that. We have the same amount of the same type of elements on each side, okay? We are not, I didn't throw in an extra hydrogen or an extra oxygen. I didn't throw in um, a helium atom or anything like that, okay? Nothing was created, no mass was created, and no mass was destroyed. Yes, I changed around the chemical structure, Yes, atoms moved around. The hydrogen atoms were no longer attached to the chlorine and the sodium. And in fact, the chlorine and sodium got attached together. That's fine. But nothing, no, none of these atoms were destroyed. And I didn't create any new atoms, okay? All I did was I took the puzzle pieces that were there and I rearranged them, okay? That's the idea about the conservation of mass. And really... That's the idea we're going to get into when it comes to balancing a chemical equation. Now let's talk about balancing chemical equations here. Really the purpose of this is to determine the amount of reactants and products required for a reaction. And so that way we have the same amount of atoms that are in the products as we're in the reactants. Just like I said before, we want to have this symbolic representation where matter, or I should say mass, isn't getting destroyed, right? We have the same number of each type of atom on one side as we do the other. But the thing is here, sometimes certain compounds don't just come as one molecule. In nature, actually, compounds sometimes come as several molecules clustered together. One example of this is actually water, H2O. H2O typically binds as two molecules, right? From my understanding, when it comes to a water molecule, you don't oftentimes, you don't really see H2O by itself. You see two H2O molecules. That's what this symbol, this symbolism means right here. I've just put a coefficient in front of H2O. And I'm telling you that, yeah, you can have an H2O molecule. Here's oxygen, and here are two hydrogens. But generally speaking, they're often paired together with another molecule. They're often bonded together with another water molecule. So, the trouble here, when I'm trying to represent a chemical reaction with symbols, I need to basically show not only what 
compounds are reacting with each other, what chemicals are reacting and getting produced, but I need to know how many of these individual compounds and molecules there are. I don't really know that necessarily unless, you know, I could get in and like check every single one with advanced technology and microscopes and whatnot. Uh, but really, we want to have a much quicker way of doing this. So we're going to use some mathematics to really help us define how many of each type of compound they're going to be for this chemical reaction. This is when pentane is going to combust. And combust means react, um, react and oftentimes by fire and oxidize. So what we have here is pentane, C5H12. I don't know how many molecules of pentane there are. And it's going to react with oxygen, but I don't know how many of these oxygen molecules there are going to be. And when they react together, we're going to have carbon dioxide, which is CO2 here, but I don't know how much CO2 is going to get produced. Like how many of these CO2 molecules will there be? And water is going to get produced, but I don't know how many of each water molecule there will be, okay? I'm trying to understand here in the physical world when I have the most basic interaction between pentane and oxygen, what's going to happen? How much of them are going, how many of these molecules will come together and react to create carbon dioxide and water? And in fact, how many carbon dioxide and how many water molecules are there going to be? It's pretty easy to see when you look at the equation how many carbons are on the left-hand side here? There are five carbons. How many carbons are on the right-hand side here? There's only one carbon. That's a problem. We're saying if you left this equation as is, you would be essentially destroying four carbon elements or four carbon atoms. You can't do that. That doesn't happen in this case. So if you started with five carbons, you better have five carbons in the end. Well, where do they go? Well, it gets back to the idea I was saying before where chemicals, or I should say uh, compounds, oftentimes aren't just a single molecule. Molecules sometimes bind together with the same versions of themselves. So we're going to try to figure out really... If you have these particular compounds, how many of them are each bound together to create this reaction? That's going to be our goal here. Now, the way in which we can go about doing this, we need to first really think about what are we being asked to identify here? Well, in this equation, we're trying to find... These question marks represent numbers. What are the amounts of each of the molecules? So those are really coefficients, if you will. Okay. So let me put in some variables for us to work with. I'm going to use the same variable several times, and I'll explain why in just a minute. The first coefficient, let me write that nicer. I'm going to label that as x1. So that's X1, and I'm going to figure out how many pentane molecules I'm, I'm going to need. And then that's going to react with however many oxygen molecules. I'm going to say however many, that's X2. And there's the oxygen. Now those react and have however many X3 of CO2 is. And it's also going to produce whatever X4 is of H2O, water. Now, sometimes people often wonder, Linford, why are you doing X1, X2, X3, and X4 as your variables? Why don't you just pick X, Y, Z, and uh, W? I don't know. 
Well, the reason for that is if I picked X, Y, Z, W, or any other number of letters for the variables, it'd start to get a little confusing. By that I mean, imagine like I had seven different compounds that I had to work with, that I had to have variables for, and I put letters for each one. The more letters I use, and keep in mind, all of these symbols here are letters. The more you use, the more confusing it's going to be and the jumbled up it's going to be. And what happens if you use a variable, like what if you use a letter for a variable that's one of these elements, right? It'll just get too confusing. So to help us out, we oftentimes just say, okay, X is the standard variable that we're working with and we're going to have little subscripts, X1, X2, X3, and X4. Um, and I like to color code them just so that way I can really see, hey, here are my variables. Here are the things I'm trying to solve for. Now, when I see these four variables, I'm trying to think, okay, what are the equipment? What, what am I really trying to get at here? And remember, it's the conservation of mass. I want the same number of carbons on both sides, and I want the same number of hydrogens, oxygens, on each side as well. So let me represent that a little more in depth. Let me make sure I get the right color here. And I'm gonna label a carbon equation. I'm gonna label what I have going on here. I'm gonna say I have in the first compound five carbons but I don't know what X1 is. If X1 is 2, then I would have 10 carbons. If X1 is 3, then I would have 15 carbons, etc. So uh, how many carbons do I have in the first compound? 5 times X1. That's how many, how many carbons I have in the first compound. How many carbons are in the second compound? Well, there's clearly... No C in there. There's no carbon listed. So I have zero carbons, okay? And I could say zero times X2. But really, that's just a zero at the end of the day, isn't it? So I have, uh, and I'm going to put the, a little slash through the zero there so it doesn't look like oxygen. So I have five carbons in the first one times however many I have of that compound. And then I have pretty much zero in the second one. And I'm going to end up with... Let's see, there is one carbon in this reaction, in this compound, I should say, this product. And, but careful, I'm multiplying it by X3. So if X3 was seven, then I would have seven carbons. Hopefully you're getting the idea with that. Really, it's just kind of like an unknown coefficient. And then how many carbons are in the last product here? Well, again, there's zero but I could say it's zero times X4. Again, that's just gonna be zero, but stay with me for the moment. So here is really an equation that, that describes the carbon, okay? And really, I don't need this arrow anymore. In fact, I'm gonna change this arrow to an equal sign. They don't do this in chemistry, but mathematically, we can think of this as an equal sign, right? Because this is really a numeric equation. Five times some number plus zero better get me one times some other number, okay? Now, there's a lot of possibilities for that. Hopefully, you're seeing there's a lot of things that this could be. X1 could be um, a one, so you could have five times one equals, and X3 could be five, right? That would get you the same number. What if they are five times, what if that's two, and this is one and X3 is a 10? There, they get the same number again. So there's a lot of possibilities that we could have here for X1 and X3. X2 and X4 really don't matter for us right now in, as far as carbon goes. However, they will matter when hydrogen and oxygen come into the situation as well. Here's the hydrogen equation. The hydrogen equation, let's see, there are, in the first compound, 12 hydrogen atoms. 
but I have whatever x1 times that is. Then, for the second operation, again, there are no hydrogen atoms in the second, so I'm just going to put a zero there with x2, because even zero times x2 is still just zero. And then that's going to equal, well, again, this time there are no hydrogen atoms in this compound, this product, so I'm going to say a zero times x3, which, again, I know is zero, but just humor me for right now. And then in the last one, I have two hydrogen atoms um, times the X4. Okay. Here I have my hydrogen equation. And while we're at it, let's write the one for oxygen. So in oxygen, the first one, there are zero times x4, I'm sorry, times x1, I gotta get these right, and then I'm going to end up with in the second compound, they are clearly written two oxygens, but then I've multiplied that by whatever x2 is, and then in the third compound, there are two oxygen, but then again, I've multiplied it by x3, so that's two times x3. And then the last one only has one oxygen times whatever x4 is. Thank you for bearing with me with that. I, I, I like to use colors and symbolism here just to really kind of help us out as we move into our next step. But let's try to identify what we see going on here. This was one chemical equation. And we just wrote three separate equations for this. One equation that describes the carbon, one that describes the hydrogen, and one that describes the oxygen. Before I said, you could see why X1 and X3 could be a lot of different. There, there's infinitely many possibilities. But I want to choose what X1 and X3 are so that it satisfies the carbon equation as well as the hydrogen equation as well as the oxygen equation. I need to pick what X1 is and X2 and x3 and x4 so that they satisfy these three equations. We need them to satisfy all the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen equations. To me, when I'm being told that you have multiple variables with multiple equations, that the variables need to satisfy each of these given equations, I start to think, it sounds like a system of equations, doesn't it? Right? Isn't this basically a system of equations? I have a number of equations, and I want to find what values for these unknown variables satisfy the three equations that make them true statements. That's a system. So what I would like to do here is I'd like to treat this like a system. Okay, The way I'm going to show you of how to balance these chemical equations, because we haven't done any balancing yet, we just try to wrap our head around what's going on here. The method I'm going to show you is not done in high school chemistry. They don't use this method in chemistry classes and they don't often show it. They have their own method for, for balancing chemical equations and it's a lot more visual and it's a lot of a kind of written down visual way of thinking about it. And sometimes it's some people think of it as like a glorified substitution method. But I think we can have a much quicker way of doing this using our knowledge of matrices. So what we first need to do here is say, these are the three equations that we need to solve. And we have four given variables. So what we should do is try to write these equations first in standard form, meaning we got to set them equal to zero. So Let's rewrite these three equations here. First up, I had 5 times x1. Bear with me as I get the colors here. And you know what? I better write these. I'll write a couple of these. 
just to save on time here, 5, 12, 0, plus 0, plus 0, plus a 2. And let's get the x2s in here. Oops. And then what I'm going to do here to set these equal to zero, I'm just going to subtract over all of the products. So in the first equation, I'm going to subtract one x3. And I'm going to subtract a zero x4. Yes, I know that zero times x4 is just zero, Trust me, keep writing it because it's going to help us when we build the matrix. And this is going to be equal to zero. So what I did here is totally valid in mathematics, right? I just subtracted the same thing from both sides. And I have this equation. This is where sometimes chemistry teachers get a little... Uh, they, they get a little frustrated or they're like, really, this representation here... Yeah, mathematically it makes sense, but chemically speaking, not really, okay? The idea that we are taking away from a certain... Because when it comes to the conservation of mass, you really don't take away from these. What does this idea of subtracting away the elements mean? Uh, so don't worry about that too much, okay? This is more so, yes, we're, we're, we're getting into a mathematical realm of thinking here, okay? We've lo we've left behind, we understood the chemical need, but we're going to use mathematics to help us solve that chemical need, okay? So don't try, as, as far as this part goes, don't try and really assign any, like, real-world physical representation to the math, to, to the kind of the symbolism of what we're doing here, if that makes sense. Um, so let's keep going. Uh, I also need to subtract, let's see, a zero and subtract a two, that had the x3s. And then I also need to subtract um, a 2 and a 1 that had the x4s. And all of these, again, are equal to 0. Now I'm doing this because, remember, in standard form, you need to have um, all the variables on one side and they need to equal a constant. In this case, they're all gonna equal zero. So, here I have a system. I have several equations uh, with the same variables, and these equations, I need to find what numbers the variables are that satisfy all three of these equations. Now, one thing I hope you're saying is, wait a minute, Linford, you have more unknowns, more variables than you do equations. If I wanted to solve this system, we should have the same number of variables and the same number of equations. So this is what's called an undetermined, um, an underdetermined system. And in fact, it's a homogeneous underdetermined system, homogeneous because all of them are equal to zero. Yes, we won't find an exact answer to this, but that's okay. I'll explain why in just a little bit. For right now, I really want us to just kind of keep going and just get the process down for how this is solved. So we had, we started with the general, the general chemical equation. And we said, really, there are three separate equations. You want to make sure the carbon equation is balanced, the hydrogen equation, and the oxygen equation. So we wrote those, and then we rewrote them so they're in standard form. So I'm going to write these, I'm going to label these as standard form. Once it's in standard form, we can go ahead and put this into a matrix. So let's go ahead and do that, and I'm going to, yeah, I'll, I'll do that right here. So the matrix will be, let's see, a five, a 12, and a zero for the first row, a zero, zero, two for the second row, a negative one, eh, a ne I don't need to write negative zero, I'll just write zero, and a negative two, um, a 0, 
a negative 2, a negative 1, and we're going to have an augmented matrix, so we're going to say all of these are equal to 0. So a couple things here. This first row, the 5, 0, negative 1, 0, and 0, this represents the carbon equation. Okay, the carbon equation. The second row represents the hydrogen equation, and the third row is the oxygen equation. Okay, they're the coefficients of the equation. Remember that. These are their coefficients. The 5, the 0, the negative 1, the 0, etc. Each of the columns corresponds to the variable. These were all the x1s. The second row, or I'm sorry, the second column is all the x2s, followed by all of the x3s, and then all of the x4s. And then, of course, these are just the constants. So here is the matrix that we're going to be working with. Um, hopefully it's making sense to you and you're seeing, okay, we got each equation, the coefficients for each one, and then here are the unknowns, the things that we're trying to solve for. Let me get a new sheet of paper here, and let me rewrite what we have, and then let's get into our calculator to see if we can figure out what these unknowns are actually going to be. So I'm just rewriting the uh, matrix over here, just so I don't forget it. We augment it so it's all zeros. Let's see here. Make sure I did that right. 5, 12, 0, 0, 0, 2. It's very important to check. And yes, okay, so we did it. We did this right. I, I wrote it down properly. Now, what do we want to do in this case? Well, why don't we do what we did before? Why don't we put this into reduced row echelon form? So let's go over to our calculators or make sure to use the links that I've provided for online um, calculations with matrices and let's see what we get when we try to REF this. All right, I'm in my calculator. I'm going to hit second and then the matrix button which is down here about Mm, three buttons down on the left. So I'm in the matrix, and what I'm going to do is, eh, I'll go to matrix C for this case. So I'm going to go over to the edit tab on the right here, and I'm going to pick one of these matrix. I'll just pick, eh, I'll pick matrix A. Now, this matrix, um, again, this was a previously stored matrix. So I want to show you how we can go and actually change this setting around. What you need to do is you need to change the rows and the columns here. So the row number, how many rows are there? Well, there are going to be three rows. So you can see that already changed. And the column number, I need to change that as well. There are really five columns here, okay, if we include the zeros at the end. So let's now start typing this in. The first row went five, zero, negative 1, 0, and then it's equal to 0 at the end. The second row went 12, 0, 0, and negative 2, and of course it's just equal to 0. Let's do the third row, the oxygen equation. That was a 0, a 2, a negative 2, and a negative 1. And of course, it was equal to zero as well. So this is, did I type that in? There. Uh, this right now stores our matrix. So I did this in matrix A, as you can see in the top left corner. What I need to do now is hit second and the quit button right next to it to get back to the home screen. Okay, I've already stored the matrix into matrix A. Remember that we need to go back into the matrix menu to get the RREF feature. So I'm going to hit second, matrix. I'm going to go over to math this time. And I'm going to select RREF, the two R's. And it tells me, okay, tell me which matrix you want to RREF. So I hit second matrix. 
I go this time to names because this is where I can select the matrices. Edit is where I edit the matrix. Math is all the operations I can do on the matrix. Names is where you select. Okay, so I want to select matrix A and I'm going to RREF this. Let's hit enter. So notice what I got here. I had a one, zero, zero, and then this long decimal and a zero. I have a zero, one, zero, this long decimal and a zero, and then a zero, zero, one, and this long decimal. First off, I don't like working with decimals. I want this to change to fractions, and you can actually do that. Before you hit anything else, you should know, first off, that your calculator always stores the answer that it just got. So what I'm going to do is use that. I'm going to hit the math button. That's the fourth one down on the left-hand side here. I just hit math. At the top, you can see there's math, number, complex, probability. In the math folder that we have here, the very first option says FRAC, F-R-A-C. Click that. What that's going to do is it's going to convert the decimals into fractions. So by hitting that, the calculator says, okay, take your previous answer, what was previously stored, and turn any decimals into fractions. That is much nicer, isn't it? Okay. In fact, let's see if that will... All right. And then here is the matrix that we result with. This is easier to see than when it was just with the uh, decimals. And you'll see why in a second. Don't work with decimals. Don't round them off. Please do not round decimals off. That will throw off your answer quite a bit. And when you're doing something like balancing a chemical equation, you need precision. You need that, okay? You need quite a lot of accuracy. So we're going to work with the fractions here. So we put this in, this matrix, into our calculator, and this is essentially what we have. So let me go ahead and let me copy this down back into our notes. So what I'm going to say here is, I'm going to draw a little arrow, and I'm going to write by R, R, E, F, just to kind of let myself know, hey, by this operation that you performed, this is the matrix that you get, one, zero, zero. 0, 1, 0, let me write that a little ni nicer, 0, 0, 1, then you had a negative 1 sixth, a negative 4 thirds, and a negative 5 sixths, and that was all equal to 0. So what's going on here? This is, um, this is kind of unexpected, isn't it? Because this isn't reduced row echelon form. In reduced row echelon form, you would have all of this augmented with these zeros, okay? You wouldn't have this extra column of constants here, of the extra column of these numbers. Really, because this is an underdetermined system, because there are more unknowns than there are equations, you're not going to be able to get this really into reduced row echelon form. Instead, this is as close as you're going to get, which is okay. Don't worry. We can still interpret this. Let's go ahead and let's write down, remember that this was the uh, column that represented x1. This was the column that represented x2. The third represented x3, and the fourth represented x4. So let's write our equations down. And by the way, you know, let me clear this space right here. Remember that this was the carbon equation, this was the hydrogen equation, and this is the oxygen equation. So let's go ahead and let's actually write these equations down. We have one x1 here minus one sixth 
x4 equals 0. That's what this first equation is telling us right here. You have 1x1, you have negative 16x4, and those combine together to give you a 0. Then, let's keep going. For the second one, you have 1, let me put some color here. Oops, you have 1x2, and then you have a negative 4 thirds x4, and that's equal to 0. And then the third one, you have 1x3, and you are going to subtract away whatever 5 sixths of x to the fourth is. And that's going to give you zero. So we really have these three equations that are going on here. We've reduced our system. Remember, our system was essentially these three equations here. And we had to find the variables that satisfy each one. Well, in reducing this with RREF, we're really saying these are the systems that you need to solve. This is as simple as it gets, okay? These are what needs to be satisfied, these three equations. And this is how we've broken it down. Well, we can do this a step further, can't we? Let's make this maybe a little easier on ourselves. Let's take x1, x2, and x3 because we just have one of each, and we're going to set that equal to the one-sixths x4, the four-thirds x4, and the five-sixths x4. So let me write those in. All right, so how does this help us, right? How does thinking of it like this help us, okay? Because we had the more so general complex standard form equations, right? You had those three and you had to figure out what all the variables were. Really, we're saying these three equations will tell you what the variables are. These are the three basic ways of solving this. To figure out what x1 is, multiply 1 sixth and x4. To figure out what x2 is, multiply 4 thirds and x4. And to figure out what x3 is, multiply 5 sixths and x4. But hopefully you're saying, okay, that's fine, but what the heck is x4 equal to? I don't have a fourth equation here. I'm not told. Well, actually, you kind of are. x4 can equal anything. So I'm going to say x4 equals x4. Isn't that true? A, a variable can equal itself. That's an identity. This is what happens when you have an underdetermined system. You end up with an identity case or a trivial case. That was really the fourth equation that we had here. x4 equals x4. And Okay, but how does this help us? What does this mean? You have to think about it in the sense that you could have an infinite number of combinations for x1, x2, x3, and x4. There could be however many combinations of the molecules that you want. For example, we could say x4 here, choose what you want it to be. And in science class, you'll come up with the most basic example. So we're going to do that in our math situation here as well. I don't want there to be a fraction atom because we can't have one-sixth of an atom, okay? So pick something for x4. We're going to say let x4 equal. Pick a number that gets rid of all of these fractions. Well, notice that their denominators here are 6, 3, and 6. So I'm going to say, let x4 equal 6. Okay? And in fact, I should probably 
If I've been color coding this whole time, I'll just stick with color coding. So, X4 is going to be 6. Okay. X1, then, is going to be 6 times uh, 1 sixth. Well, what's 6 times 1 6? That's just 1. And then let's figure out what x2 is going to be. And x3. So, for x2, if we have 4 thirds times x4, and x4 is 6, 4 thirds times 6 is going to be an 8. And then let's say, okay, um, one, or, or I'm sorry, 5 sixths times 6 for x3 is just going to be a 5. So I've gone now and said, I figured out essentially what the most basic combination of compounds could be. But that's when we said x1 is a 6. I'm sorry, x4 is a 6 here. We could have had it be anything else. Pick something like 24. What if you said, I got 24 of these compounds together? Well, x1 would then be, let's see, what's 1 6 of 24? That's 4. And then 24 times 4 thirds, that would be uh, 32. And then 24 times 5 6, I think that would be 20. So really, this would be equivalent to this. You get the same amount, right? or you get the same balance. You have different amounts of compounds, but you get one side equaling the other side. You still have a balanced equation. The reason for this is there's a lot of possibilities it could be. So with an undetermined system, really there's infinitely many solutions. You can keep having multiples but we want to know what's the most basic setup. And for us, the most basic setup is this. The most basic way in which I have all whole number atoms, all whole number compounds. So let's go ahead and let's rewrite the equation we started with. So here we had x1 which is how much pentane there was. Well, we said x1 is just one. So there is one molecule of penta pentane, and that's going to react with how many molecules of oxygen? Well, we said eight. So this is an eight. And then we are going to produce a certain amount of molecules of carbon dioxide. We're saying here that's five. So there are five molecules of carbon dioxide. And then how many water molecules will there be? Well, we set it to be six. So this right here this is our final answer. This is our balanced chemical equation. You can check all of the variables, and you'll see that there are the same amount on each side. Take a look at hydrogen. There's 12 on this side. Here, I have 2 for every oxygen, and I have 6 altogether. Uh, so I have, if I have 2 for every molecule, and there's 6 molecules, I have 12 hydrogen. Look at carbon. There's five carbons here. There's five carbons there. And then the oxygen. Let's see, oxygen was paired together, so there were two for each one, and I have eight of those molecules, so that should be 16. Well, let's see, I have six of them right here. And then if I have five of the O2s here, that's 10. Hey, that makes 16. So this is a balanced chemical equation. It's... I know it seems a little tedious at first, but when you start doing this and you get more comfortable with it, you'll get very quick at one, making the matrix. 
you can jump from your general equation right into making the matrix. And then once you have the matrix, you can row reduce it. And once it's row reduced, you can go ahead and say, okay, here are my solutions, and how am I going to choose them? Again, keep in mind that when we had this equation, when we had 1, C5, H12, uh, plus 8, O2, and that produces 5, CO2, and 6, H2O, Again, there are a lot of possibilities for this. And this is what you need to understand. You could have had one molecule, eight molecules, then resulting with the five and the six, okay? But you could have, like I said, had any other multiple of this. What if it was two? What if you doubled all of these? You could have two C5H12 plus 16 O2, resulting in 10 CO2, and 12 H2O. These are both balanced. And really, they're the same thing, right? They're the same amount of carbons and the same amount of hydrogens on each side, so they're both balanced. It's just one has more atoms than the other, okay? And obviously, in chemical reactions, you can have, depending on how much there is, how much quantity, you can have different amounts of atoms in there, different amounts of atoms to be produced. So, there is a possibility, and this is where I'm saying, really, you have infinite amount of possibilities. This example is just the most basic. That's the most basic example of what you need, okay? Then you can figure out later on, okay, do I have twice as much, three times as much, four times as much, 500 times as much, I don't know, however much, okay? Hopefully this is making sense to you, and you're seeing the process for how we took the matrix, or, or how we built the matrix first, and then put it into RREF form. Once it was RREF'd, do you like how I made that word up? R R E F. -t. We then took it and we separated into the different equations. Hopefully, this is making sense to you. Give this a little more practice and start to see if you're getting quicker with this, okay? If you have any questions or comments about this video, I'm sure a lot of people probably have some questions and want to go over some more, please let me know. My email is klinford, that's K L I N F O R D at wccnet.edu. Let me know if you have any questions or comments, and until next time, take care.